The title of the message is, today is the new sermon. The sermon you've never heard before that I've never, give, never given before with scriptures that I've never used before. In the Bible, however, we're all familiar with and a message that is not new, uh, but, but different. So I was challenged a week ago to give a sermon with scriptures I've never used before. I mean, you've, you've probably heard the accusation, and I think, I mean, it's somewhat valid, that ministers really only have one sermon. And all they do is recycle it and change out uh, scriptures, and they do a bad job of that because they keep repeating the same scriptures over time. So I, I said, good, I'm going to do this. And then I, I looked at how would I give a sermon, I mean, first of all, how do I remember which scriptures I've never used before? So, I mean, I'm, I'm doing this from memory, uh, so I may, I may just infringe on it a little bit, uh, but I'll, I'll be it unintentionally. But then, I, but then I looked at it and thought, this is not challenging enough. This is not challenging enough because there are, I only memorized 600 scriptures. Uh, during my college career, I will confess, I don't have those all committed to memory any longer, but you know, 600 scriptures aren't really that many when you consider the entirety of this book. So it's like, okay, so I'm, I'm going to up the challenge. Not only am I not going to use scriptures that I've used before, but the, the, the message has to be uh, relevant for us, to, for us in this new time today. And uh, then, then I realized that it's so easy that I'm going to take them all from one book. So now that you've had that, uh, that introduction, get out your Bibles because we're going to go to a different place today for a new time for, with a topic that I trust you will find relevant to the time we find ourselves in. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 59. Now, now I'll, I'll have to preface this. I've used Isaiah chapter 59 before, just not the verses that uh, we're going to look at today. And, and, and actually... As we get into this, you will find out that there are several verses in Isaiah chapter 59 that are pivotal on this particular topic. So in order to, in order to abide by my friend's challenge, I'm just going to go to other scriptures within the book of Isaiah that essentially say the same thing so that we do, do not lose the message. Isaiah chapter 59, please. We're going to look at verse 8. Now, I've never used this scripture before, but you've heard it before. Isaiah chapter 59. <clears throat> verse 8. The way of peace they have not known. And there is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked path. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. Now, I would dare say the first part of it, you've, you've heard that. I've heard it, but I haven't used it, as near as I can tell. What I want you to pay attention to as we kind of outline this particular message from the prophet Isaiah is the pronouns that he uses. And he keeps alternating between two different categories of pronouns, all personal pronouns, but... Uh, when, when we get through this next section, I want to put these, you'll have to either, if you have notes, if you're taking notes, you'll have to write it down in columns. I'm giving a little bit of a heads up so that you know where we're going. Or you have to create columns in your mind and stack them up in there. But you notice here in this particular passage, the prophet is addressing the people to whom he's speaking and by extension to all of us. I mean, he's, Isaiah was writing and prophesying to Israel. And that message, the way to peace they do not know, I would dare say, is as relevant today as it ever has been. Because if there's one thing that is evident in the past month is that we're not on a path to peace. And it's easy for us to have a us and them mentality. I'm going to challenge that. I'm going to challenge us on that today because the, there are different categories of pronouns that are used. In this particular case, he uses the way of peace they do not know. They have not known. There is no justice 
in their ways. Again, the kind of us and them pronoun, but justice has ceased. And the ends justify the means in the, uh, in the situation we find ourselves into, into. And the reason is, they have, as it says here, made themselves crooked path. Crooked path is a metaphor that uh, typifies the way absent God because people just wander to and fro and make a path on whatever they deem to be right instead of the straight and narrow way that Jesus, Jesus Christ describes in the New Testament. Now that was just an aside, okay? I did not go to that verse. I just cited it, okay? So we're not, we're not breaking any rules here, my friend who's in, in the audience. So the next verse, however, puts in a, an operative word. It says, therefore... For this reason, and I want to just walk through this with you, and I want you to notice the pronouns, because here we have what I call cause and consequence. The cause is that they make crooked path, and a whole host of other things that come before that. They, they do not know the way to peace. So that's the cause, and then for every cause there's a consequence, and hence the word therefore. Therefore, justice is far from us, nor does righteousness overtake us. Now here's the, <clears throat> here the, the category of pronouns changes. We look for light. We. Notice what that sounds like, how different that sounds. Before it was their path, they do not know, and now the prophet makes it more, pro more personal and he says, we look for light, but there is darkness. I mean, we look out there and we hope to, as a business friend of mine told me this week that, um, it, that, is, that delivers raw material to the automotive industry. And I said, how is it going? He said, well, you know, orders are finally beginning to start up. We see light at the end of the tunnel. And we just hope, you've heard this before, it's not a train coming in the other direction. So, you know, people, we look for light, but we see only darkness. But notice that it's, it's no longer them, it's us. Because the pronoun that is used is we. For brightness, but we walk in blackness. We grope for the wall like the blind. I mean, that is, if the we becomes more personal, that is really an indictment to those of us that should know a clear path. We grope for the, for the wall like the blind, and we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as at twilight, and we are as dead men in desolate places. Okay, so in this cause and consequence, what you, what you see are two, two verbs, being and doing. I mean, you can, you can summarize most of life in, in those two particular um, verbs, if you will. It's who we are and what we do. What we're doing here, it says, is we look for light, we grope, we stumble, but we are as dead men. The state of our being is really, really grave. And as a result, you know, the, the con condition and everything that we're, we find ourselves in, the actions, the actions are consistent with the condition and state we are in. Notice, we growl like bears. I have some kids out there that could, come on kids, growl like a bear, come on. <laughs> That, that, I can't hear you. That was better. We growl like bears and moan sadly like doves. That is a, you know, I, I've got a whole list here in my notes. There's seven, there's seven we's in this particular consequence. Let me just reiterate um, them again. We look for light, we grope, we stumble, we are as dead men, we growl and moan, 
verse and verse the, the seventh one I hadn't uh, read yet. We look for justice, but there is none. For salvation, but it is far off. So now it now the the, the prophet changes his um, message a little bit, and we go from our condition and consequence, and we see what happens. And notice, it's still we, and our, and us. For our transgressions are multiplied before, multiplied before you, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us. And as for our iniquities, we know them in transgressing and lying against God. So, here you have a set of three, our transgressions, our sins testify against us, we know our iniquities, and um, about this time you're thinking, well, you know, this is a really, really positive message, right? I mean, maybe you want me to go back to an old sermon, you know, something that is a little bit easier to hear uh, something that is a little bit more uplifting and inspirational. Well, we're not done yet. The, 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 prophet, the prophets of old um, were very good at giving messages that were hard to hear and then come around with a message of hope as he does here at the end, and we'll get there. But we have a set of three here that, that is really an indictment against us. Our transgressions are multiplied, our sins testify against us, and we know our iniquities. And then he enumerates them. Notice, in transgressing and lying against the Lord, in departing from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from, from the heart words of falsehood. I can't think of how you could write a article today, I was going to say in the New York Times, but if I do that, they probably uh, wouldn't write it quite this way, um, that is more apropos and to point to the condition we're seeing today. And, and that, I, I don't think, should surprise us. Because the sons of Jacob literally live in the country we know and love. And the Israel of God, the Church of God, is uh, at work here as well. So it should not surprise us that a message to ancient Israel resonates today with our nation and the Church. Because at the end of the day, the universal truth and principles that govern human, human behavior and create condition and consequence have not changed, and neither will they. We have to sleep in the bed we made, we have to suffer the consequences of our actions, and as it says here, the, our sins are ever before us. <clears throat> and then finally, as we as we conclude this section, I think it is interesting that the prophet personifies several pillars of any decent and prosperous society. And the, the pillars that he personifies are, are uh, truth, equity, and righteousness. <clears throat> Notice it says that justice is turned back. Justice is turned back because righteousness stands afar off. Think about what that means. And truth is fallen in the street. I mean, we've seen that literally. Okay? We're, we are tearing down statues and they're falling into the street that demonstrate the truth of our history, whether right or wrong. I mean, you cannot change the facts of history. You cannot change the future by renaming it 
as something else. So that's one example, but I think more importantly, truth as a virtue is a rare commodity these, these days. It's, and it's personified here as it's fallen in the street. And equity cannot, anger, uh, cannot enter. You know, when righteousness stands afar off, and no longer is active, and truth is fallen in the street, you create a condition where e equity cannot enter in. I mean, it's a personification, it's a metaphor, but it is also a universal truth. That's just the way it works. So, truth fails. And here is, the, he concludes here with something that I find extremely scary. You know, when truth fails, when, when we get to the point where lawlessness abounds and a rule of law is no longer the, uh, the, the, what can be relied upon, some of those things don't work anymore. <coughs> truth fails. And notice verse 15. And he who departs from evil. I mean, departing from evil is normally something to be applauded. And indeed, is always to be applauded. But notice, under these conditions, one who departs from evil makes himself prey. Wow. That's encouraging. That's a new sermon with a new scripture I've never used. And by this time, you're ready for me to go back to an old sermon. So let's turn back a page. Now I have to be careful. I have to be careful. I can't start in verse 1. Because if I do so, I go back to an old sermon. So I'm going to start in verse 3. And notice again the pronouns. For your hands are defiled with blood or bloodshed, and your fingers with iniquity, your lips have spoken lies, your tongues have muttered, muttered perversity. And yet, now he broadens it out, no one calls for justice. No one. You know, it's kind of like the, the story of the, the, the people that were going to do a job. You know, everybody thought that somebody would do the job, but it ended up that nobody did it. So I've always said, I've been looking for a long time to hire nobody, because that's the person that normally does, did the job. So here, we have a situation where you, we go away from the personal pronouns, and you broaden it, and you know you have the us and them, but, but in this particular context, no one calls for justice. I mean, I read an article this past week that I think was an op-ed by Dennis Prager in which he said that Christians and the Jews are failing our nation. And, um, I mean, he was basically an indictment against ministers and, in, in the case of, um, and, and rabbis and priests. And his point was, you know, whatever your situation may be with the social issues that we have, why is no one speaking out on the issues that are very clear? Rioting in the streets and destroying property is stealing and plunder and is wrong. You know, that's, that is something that has nothing to do with past wrongs or skin color or anything of that sort it's just a question of right and wrong i was um happy to see him speak up i mean he, he's been a um a strong voice and in most cases um uh, very um um very concise in in what he says and effective but what about you I mean, what about me what about all of us? I mean, the, the us in what the prophet is addressing, I mean, are, are we strong and bold enough to just say, you know what? What is going on is wrong. 
It is not justified. It will help no one. It's going to hurt the very people that claim to need help. And they do. I'll give you an Amish equivalent. So we're, we're right down the stream here from Charm. Everybody knows. He comes through Charm. Everybody know where Charm's at? How many of you have been to Kind Lumber? Not everybody. It's a big building store in the area. So we, the, the local sheriff's name is Sheriff Simmerly. So we, we, I want to address, and I don't want to minimize you know, the, the issue of uh, police brutality. That is a problem, but it is a small problem, not a big problem. So Sheriff Simmerly has a renegade deputy who comes to charm and cuts the beard off an Amish man. I mean, that's a local example of police brutality. And the Amish, in retribution, burned down Kaim Lumber, where 600 of them work. I'm making this story up, don't worry, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I saw somebody gasp, okay? I'm, I'm simply looking at it as an illustration. Okay, we, we, we cannot allow ourselves to get caught up in whatever the latest political social unrest is and miss the fundamental issues that we're talking about. There is never an excuse for violence. There is never a reason to burn things down. It's just, I mean, it, it, it is wrong and it doesn't make sense, just like it wouldn't make sense for the Amish to burn down time lumber, which um, they never do, okay? It, it, just, it, it just provides an illustration. We come back here, no one calls for justice, nor does any plead for truth. They, and now, now it switches. They trust in empty words and speak lies and they conceive evil and bring forth iniquity they hatch viper's eggs and weave spider's web he who eats their eggs dies and from that which is crushed a viper breaks out so let's get to the categories here we, we've heard a lot of pronouns that are used by the prophet so on on your piece of paper on the left you make one column and on your piece of paper on the right, you make another column. And we start out with us and them. I mean, you've, you've heard that. Us and them. You know, them, their guys over there. And, you know, we and they. And that's another combination. Our and their. You, you and them, or your and their. You see how this works. And these are all pronouns that the prophet, the prophet uses. So, so the question is, how does that, you know, how does that translate back into the Bible, back into the context of this particular passage? And and that, and I think we could categorize it like this: on the right hand side of the column, <coughs> we have Israel, and on the left hand, Gentile. We have righteous and we have the wicked. We have the believer and the unbeliever. We have the holy and the profane. We have the religious and we have the secular. And we have, to use a modern term, the right and the left. I mean, these are, it's, it, it's ironic how you know, these two categories have remained true through time. But, but I think the challenge for us and the thing that we need to take to heart here, it's really easy. It is really easy for us to have an us versus them cat, uh, uh, mentality. <clears throat> I mean, look at what they are doing. <clears throat> they. I mean, you know, they're, they're secularists. I mean, they're leftists. You know, you, you they. And it's really easy to forget about us. And what the prophet does here, I see people looking up. 
Do I need to back up and leave you sitting in the rain? Okay, there's an airplane out there. Yeah, you've got to keep working on this. I mean, this new sermon, you're getting distracted here. The, the us and them mentality is dangerous in any case. It always is. It's so easy to say, well, those Protestants, or if when you're a Protestant, it's those Catholics. You know, you, 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 you pick the, the category um, when, you know, even in, within the Amish community, I mean, there you have uniform, uniformity, right? Oh, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. People are just plain mean. I went to an Amish school where everybody looked the same, and guess what? We were mean. I mean, the others were mean. Not me. The other ones were mean to me. They called me names. You know, beat me up. And, and yet, uh, it, it, and I, I point that out because even in a culture in which um, uniform dress code and uniform identity in, 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 in very many aspects of life, it does not prevent meanness. And a lot, of, a lot of what we're seeing in our, in our country right now has nothing to do with skin color. It has everything to do with flawed human nature and wickedness and meanness. Um, that's, that's just the way it is. So getting back to the prophet, the prophet takes, plays no favorites in this particular passage. He is just as hard, perhaps even more so, on the your and the us and the you, meaning those of the covenant of Israel. And you know, the they, I think, covers two things, the Gentiles, as well as those who had departed from the covenant and were doing wickedly. So, <clears throat> as we look at this, this, the iniquities that we're talking about, and we'll just read a few more, and um, to bring it back to verse 8, if we, if we continue to, to read here in verse 6, nor will they cover themselves with their works. Their works are works of iniquity, and the act of violence is in their hands. Their feet run to evil, and they make haste to shed innocent blood. I mean, think about how that applies to what we saw in the streets of America in the last number of weeks. The feet ran, there was violence, there was wasting and destruction in their path. In some cases, it looked like the bombed out streets of Peru. But it was them, not us. It's not that easy. So now we come to the problem with the new sermon. Because this whole discussion by the prophet pivots around the first two verses of chapter 59, which I cannot use, and the last several verses of chapter 58, which I also cannot use, and I see you looking, okay? So you're, you're cheating. I mean, you're looking at the verses that I'm not allowed to use. But that's what, where it pivots. It talks, it, the, the iniquity is defined, and the separation is defined, but I have a solution. I'm just going to go to another verse that I've never used that says precisely the same thing because as the prophet continues to prophesy to Israel, he says the same thing over and over again. <clears throat> so did Isaiah chapter 50. Isaiah chapter 50. <clears throat> now I'm going to read verses 1 through 3 because chapter 50, 1 through 3 has a very similar but somewhat different message. In fact, I mean, I, I found this, this exercise to be enlightening because, you know, you, know, you get used to using a particular verse to make a point. And this makes the same point, but I think expands on it. I mean, I will let you be the, be the judge of that. Verse 1, Thus says the Lord, Where is the certificate of your mother's divorce, which I put away? Notice, 
mean, I, it, it's just kind of like when God was talking to Moses and said, you know, what is it with you, the people that you brought out of uh, Egypt and that you did this? I mean, here, here the Lord is saying to Isaiah, where is the certificate of divorce of your mother that I have put away? Um, why didn't God say, where is my wife's divorce certificate? Because God divorced Israel. So uh, find, I find that an interesting way of putting it. Or which of my creditors is it to whom I have sold you? For your iniquities you have sold yourselves. Now if you go back to chapter 59 verse 1, it says exactly the same thing in a different way. What it says here is that the iniquities that you have had have sold you yourself. I mean, you got what you had coming. For your transgressions, your mother has been put away. Why, when I came, was there no man? Why, when I called, was there none to answer? Is my hand shortened at all that it cannot redeem? I mean, is, is God incapable of acting? The answer is a resounding no when he came and wanted to act, or he was looking to act, there was no one who responded. And that is the indictment against us. What have we done? What have I done? Tangibly. To make a difference while we still had or have the constitutional right to do so. And I will refrain, I will go back to a refrain I've used, said many times. If we fail to push back and stand when we have a constitutional right to collectively do so, if we fail at that, We will be called upon individually to stand for what we actually believe when we no longer have a constitutional right to do so. And you don't need much imagination right now to see that possibility. Because, as I, I told you know, people this week, we were talking about people, people call me, how are you doing? You know, business people are talking back and forth. Um, what do we do? How do we deal with? It, it's been, you know, when, when, when you have business owner friends who are, um, that uh, have one individual who genuinely cares for people. I mean, he just um, really cares. He had the job of laying off 1,200 of his 1,400 employees, their revenue dropped 95%. They were losing a million dollars a week. What people fail to realize is money doesn't grow on trees and businesses are in a competitive environment where if you're down, if you're down for a month, many are done. I mean, fortunately, this was a well-heeled a uh, multi-generational uh, company that has reserves and they'll be okay. But, I mean, it, th these are tough things. Um, and, um, you know, there are they're, they're consequences. So back to the conversation, you know, here's where, th here's where I'm at. I'm not scared of the virus anymore, okay? Now let me clarify that, okay? I'm not saying the virus is not dangerous. The virus is something that needs to be respected and we need to take precautions. That, I mean, any sensible person <clears throat> would say that. But that's not going to be the biggest problem. I'm very concerned about the economic consequences that uh, have taken the livelihood of 20 million people and you know the, the psychological impact and the dominoes that are going to fall from that is probably going to kill way more people than the virus ever would. Okay, so I'm, I'm not scared about the virus, I'm concerned about the economic, I'm absolutely terrified 
at the um, breaking apart of the uh, social order and structure that has served our country well for over 200 years. That is the real problem. And if that continues, if that is allowed to continue, um, it will be terrifying. I mean, that's, we, we, we have seen on our television screens, um, if I may say this, the left has exposed what they intend to do. And uh, it's no longer something that we need to guess about. But it's always been that way. Socialism has never worked. It's never worked anywhere. And capitalism, for all its faults, is the best man has ever been able to devise. And we, we just, we, those, are, those are real things. Ideas have consequences, as, as we saw here in, in the prophet. Notice, we, we continue here in, in uh, chapter 50. Why, when I came, was there no man? And I, I look at that and I ask myself, I mean, I, what have I done? I mean, what have I really done? You know, when have I stood up and spoken boldly and stood for the truth? I mean, I have done that in some cases. I know that. So have you, or you wouldn't be here today on one of the pivotal issues that we find in the very passage we're looking at, the Sabbath. Okay? That's an element of truth that has brought you here. But what else have we done? Okay? When have we not answered when God called? I mean, he said, my hand wasn't shortened. Or, I, or have I no power to deliver? Indeed, was my rebuke, I dry up the sea. I made the rivers a wilderness. Their fish stink because there is no water and die of thirst. I closed the heavens with blackness, and I made sackcloth of their covering. I mean, that's, that's the God that we serve. It is not, as he says here, that his hand is too short that he can't reach down from heaven and help. That's not the problem. Okay, then there is an alternative to Isaiah chapter 58, the, the last several verses that um, talk about the Sabbath. Isaiah chapter 56. Verse 2, Blessed is the man who does this, and the son of man who lays hold on it, who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and keeps his hand from doing any evil. I mean, it's interesting. He doesn't say who keeps the Sabbath. He's talking about defilement. Defilement is strong language and, you know, we can say, well, you know, what difference does it really make? Well, apparently, with God, it makes a difference. Now, the, the, the interesting thing to me is this. We, we go from, I mean, there, there's always a predictable progression from truth to error, from sound-mindedness to insanity from uh, a, a structured and law-abiding society to anarchy. And it can be, be described like this. You go from the specific to a, uh, maybe, you go from the definite article to the indefinite article to it doesn't matter at all. So. The progression is you go from the Sabbath day on the Sabbath day that is consistent with when God created man and the universe to a Sabbath day to any day. And that's, that's the progression everything goes through. When truth is very specific and it's kind of black and white. I know that's not politically correct, but truth by definition is black and white. And when you when you start mixing in gray, and then and it, you just you know you, you you go to insanity. So we had in this country a we we had from the very founding people, albeit a small group, that kept the Sabbath. And some of the founders, some of the signers of the Declaration of Independence, were Sabbath keepers. The um, 
But what we did have, up until and including my childhood, was a, a pretty consistent social structure around a Sabbath, meaning Sunday. And even though the day was wrong, there is there was a benefit of the seven-day cycle and a a an interruption of the 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 24-hour-a-day mill that we now find ourselves in. I, I have a I have a one of these really specific memories of of sitting in the front of my Amish mom and dad's horse and buggy. We had a little bench. I, you know, you think about it. We were sitting on the box on the little bench. I mean, if we'd ever gotten hit, you'd have been f thrown in every direction. But nonetheless, I'm sitting there, we're going up the hill on a Sunday morning, everything is really, really quiet. And at the Lutheran church on the top of the hill, which has now been um, uh, pulled down, were a, 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 a long line of men waiting to go in to the church on that Sunday morning. And they were doing what was customary at that time. They're all standing there by right, telling lies and puffing their pipe. You know, they <laughs> it was just smoking cigars and puffing pipes and, and all that. But nobody worked on Sunday. There was an interruption of daily activity. And I remember the scandal that went through our community when one of them, a next generation guy, had the audacity to get his chainsaw out and cut down a tree on Sunday. I mean, it, uh, the world was just about to end. Okay? So we went from the Sabbath to a Sabbath to today. Everybody mows their grass. I mean, the, the, the astonishing thing is, is how we acculturate. You know, even the, not the real conservative Mennonite churches, but the more, you know, center liberal Mennonite churches, uh, they, they, they have no issue with going to church in the morning, working in the afternoon at a coffee shop or, you know, whatever. They, that's, that's just become the norm. It's a 24-7 operation, even in this community. That's how much has changed in my short life, I would have the young people know. My life has been short, and I'm still young, by the way. Not, not you know, don't, don't look at my gray beard. That, that's just, I, I, I bleach that every morning, so I, uh, to to give the impression of wisdom. I, I simply make that point that these these structures are there and they have consequences and we when when we remove that and we go away from the indefinite article to just any day, insanity and uh, anarchy ensues. <clears throat> Now notice here, verse 3, Do not let the son of the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord speak, saying, The Lord has utterly separated me from his people. Now, here, here the prophet hints at the solution. You know, the, the foreigner that had been brought into Israel was not separated from the covenant. And he continues, nor let the eunuchs say, here I am a dry tree, for thus says the Lord to the eunuchs who keep my Sabbath, plural, and choose what pleases me and hold fast my covenant, even to them I have given my house and my walls a place and a name, better than the sons and daughters, better than that of sons and daughters, I will give them an everlasting name and they shall not be cut off. Also the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord and serve him, and love the name of the Lord to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath holds fast my covenant. Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. When you look at the message of the prophet Isaiah, the iniquities pivot around two things. There are many others, but the two pivotal ones were idolatry and Sabbath defilement. And when he talks about what he's talking about in the um, chapter 59, it pivots in verse 1 and 2. I mean, there are no chapter breaks in, in the Hebrew Bible and chapter 58 and coming forward. The separation that occurred and the indictment that he put both on the believer and the unbeliever, the foreigner and the citizen of Israel, the left and the right, 
all revolved around that one thing because not only was the unbeliever believer in the secular participating in idolatry and Sabbath breaking and a whole host of other evils, so was the house of Israel. And if we look at a nominal Christianity, and we can still say, okay, them, right? If we look at what, what has happened from the 1960s forward, I can make a case that I can win in court that they have not stood against the tide of secularism. They have embraced it and have participated in it. And that is why we are where we are today. And dare I say this, so have we. So what's the solution? Let's go back to Isaiah chapter 59. Verse 16. Under in my Bible, the Redeemer of Zion. Then the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no justice. And he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his own arm brought salvation for him and his own righteousness sustained him for he put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, according, accordingly he will re, repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, the coastlands he will fully repay, so they shall fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. God himself intervened. Because no one else did. That is the only solution. But it doesn't mean we can't do anything or that we shouldn't be doing something. And we see that if we go back to, I mean the solution is salvation. But if we go back to um, chapter 50, you know I only read the first several verses. Chapter 50, verse 4. This is what the Lord has given all of us. I mean, this is, in, in one respect, prophetic, as we will see. It, it alludes, at least, to Jesus Christ, but... Why is that a problem? Isn't Christ supposed to be living in us? Aren't we following his footsteps? And I always like to put it this way, if we follow Jesus, you know, we talk about following Jesus Christ's footsteps, isn't that, I mean, that, 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 that sounds so cute, you know? You know, it just, you know, I'm a, a follower of, of Jesus Christ, and then you have footsteps, it becomes more specific. Notice that? You know, you go from the general, I follow Jesus Christ. You, you, you can kind of make that whatever. It's kind of like the, the popular saying, what would Jesus do? Well, you know, in, in this particular circumstance, Jesus would understand and he would do what I am going to do except instead of doing what I should do. I mean, it's really the wrong question. You should never ask, what would Jesus do? You should ask, what did Jesus do? So you go from following Jesus Christ to following in his footsteps, and if you follow Jesus Christ's footsteps, it, among other things, takes you down the dusty trails of Galilee right into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. So, you don't go to the synagogue on the Sabbath day? No, at some, at some point, the footsteps departed. And then it gets even, even more specific. You know, it, uh, what we're doing is tracing the road back from anarchy and lawlessness to the law of Christ, if you will. You go from following Jesus Christ to following his footsteps to having him live in you. That's the definite way. 
The Lord God has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak. I mean, we, we have by Jesus Christ's own testimony that on the one hand we should not think about or, I mean, it's really, a, it, we should not, um, as most of us do, you know, fret over what we're going to say when we're confronted. But rather, count on what it says here that the Lord has given me the tongue of the learned. I mean, that, that, when the Holy Spirit was at work in the New Testament, people were amazed that fishermen, you know, unlearned from Galilee, were able to, you know, speak great words of wisdom. That's not hard anymore, guys. We have so many experts and secularists today that are complete, inept fools. When you compare um, the pompous things that they say and claim with, you know, I have a really healthy respect for the common man. You know, the, when I say the common man, is really kind of the uncommon man that actually gets up in the morning and goes to work and does a day's labor for um, an appropriate wage. People like that have what is called common sense. And it's really uncommon. But you, you, you connect that with the promise here. The Lord has given me the tongue of the learned that I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. The Lord has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, nor did I turn back. I gave my back to those who struck me. Here is uh, the prophecy of Jesus Christ. And my cheeks to those who plucked out the beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting, for the Lord... God will help me, therefore I will not be disgraced. Therefore I have set my face like flint, and I know that I will not be ashamed. You see, this is, this is why we can have confidence, as was alluded or spoken of in the sermonette. You know, think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. <laughs> and what the story does not tell that I'm confident, this is the unspoken that I can't prove, but I think uh, I can say it was confidence. What it doesn't say is the thousands of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's countrymen who bowed down to the idol. I'm sure there were thousands who thought it's completely ridiculous. I mean, just do it one time. Just one time. Isaiah chapter 56. <clears throat> In verse 7, we read, Even them I will bring to my holy mountain. Here's the solution. This is future. And make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accepted on my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all. The Lord God who gathers the outcast of Israel says, Yet I will gather to him others besides those who are gathered to him. And we conclude back in Isaiah chapter 59. In verse 20 and 21. Because ultimately here's the solution. But what I want to highlight is that we need to participate in the solution now. Because if we don't, we may, may not be able to participate in the solution tomorrow. Verse 20, the Redeemer will come to Zion and to those who turn from the transgression in Jacob, and says the Lord. As for me, says the Lord, this is my covenant with them, the others, the us, the them. God is, made to, God is going to make a covenant with them, he says here. My spirit is upon you. 
but he's making a covenant with them as well. My spirit is upon you, my covenant is with them, and my words which I put in your mouth shall not depart from your mouth, nor from my from the mouth of your descendants, nor from the mouth of your descendants' descendants, says the Lord, for this time and forever more. This was a new sermon with new scriptures for a new time. 